Hello, everyone. Welcome to Game Design and Analysis. This week, we're going to talk about physical games. That's everything from board games to sports to role-playing games and beyond. At the end of the um, lecture, there will be a bonus video on game design patterns, and I'll introduce that here and link to it in the uh, video's assignment. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, <clears throat> physical games. So physical games uh, is a lot, and I'm gonna try to do it in uh, 20 to 30 minutes. So I'm going to go pretty fast, but um, we've been making digital games for something like 30 years now, um, maybe a little bit more. And uh, we've been playing physical games for somewhat longer than that. Uh, earliest uh, recorded games date back to 3,500 BC or so. Um, so this could be a whole class, right? Like maybe something like history of play, um, where we could talk about the evolution of play and games in, in human society. Uh, we're going to do it in half an hour. So very high level overview, give you a sense of, of what's going on outside of the computer. Um, the idea of one person making a game is pretty new that uh, you know the the person who made doom is John Romero or, or John Carmack or you know even a small team of people like that um, that that one person designed the game we haven't really thought about games that way in the past um, games have more evolved than been designed uh, think of it as crowdsourced uh, iterative design right uh, kids kick a ball around kids kick a ball around through trees two teams of kids kick a ball around through trees you map out the size of the field, you start coming up with rules to keep you from punching people in the face, and then pretty soon you have uh, you know, football or, or soccer. Um, and uh, in fact, that is essentially uh, what happened. Um, you know, that game uh, was Suchu or Kuju uh, and evolved in China around 3,500 years ago. Um, and you know, is seen as the ancestor of uh, football now. Um, so sports uh, are one of the earliest ways that we had organized play. There are records of running and swimming contests um, in cave walls, cave paintings in uh, France, dating back you know, to, to prehistory. Um, there are records of early boxing, archery, and gymnastics uh, contests and cultures in different places in the world. Uh, you know, those kind of things leading up to Olympic kind of competitions in ancient Greece, but they go back considerably further than that. Um, in Mesoamerica, a number of different cultures played a uh, ball game uh, that sort of persisted from one culture to another. Uh, it was important in a number of religious practices. Uh, there was human sacrifice involved in some of those uh, cultures. But, um, you know, that ball game involved throwing balls through hoops, right? Uh, looks looks uh, not precisely like, but has some, some similarities to something like basketball, um, which was a much more modern game uh, evolved in, I believe, the 1800s uh, and was intentionally designed by one person. We'll get to that later. Board games, likewise, have a very long history. The sort of oldest extant uh, game artifacts that we have are from a game uh, we call Mancala now, which involves moving stones around the, uh, a board um, from little different pockets carved carved in a board, stones moved around those. Uh, with that game, we don't know what the original rules for the game were. Uh, we have pieces, but we don't know what the rules are. Um, the earliest game that we have both the rules and the pieces for is the Royal Game of Ur, which was ancient Sumerian. Uh, those are pictures of it down below here. Um, you can see the board, uh, the triangle piece is a little pyramid shaped die that was used to determine uh, movement. Your pieces were the little, the little tokens with the spots on them. And we have the cuneiform tablet that describes the rules for how that game was played, which is, is pretty amazing. So uh, that game we have a, a detailed uh, understanding of. And in fact, uh, if you are in uh, my section of the class, maybe some of the others, I have a uh, copy of the Royal Game of Ur that was created by a Northeastern student as part of a Kickstarter in which they modernized the game and added a, uh, a randomizing deck mechanic to the play as well. Um, so I can uh, let you all take a look at that. And it's kind of neat that it was made just uh, a year or so ago by a Northeastern student. Um, obviously more, more well-known games, uh, Go and Chess um, have, were games that are evolved. We don't know who initially created the game. Um, 
and uh, they have you know changed uh, over time to our modern rule sets. Uh, card games, likewise, uh, were were created in the same kind of a way. The idea of a trick-taking card game goes back a really long way. The modern tarot deck is actually a deck that was created in 14th century Italy for the play of a trick-taking card game called Tarocci um, or Tarok. Um, and uh, that style of card game has evolved into things like bridge and hearts and spades, all of those style of games. Um, but modern card games you know, have this ongoing history that, uh, that dates quite far back. So modern board games, uh, things that we think of when we think of board games now, right? Like not architectural relics or cultural games like Go or Chess, but things that, that you play um, more, more recently. Uh, so the game in the, uh, the top there is uh, actually the original version of Monopoly, which was known as the Landlord's Game. It was created as a, uh, as a commentary or criticism of capitalist ideals was ironically co-opted and became a game that celebrated capitalism uh, is you know a, a popular game to this day in its various guises. Um, let's talk a little bit about different kinds of modern board games though. Uh, a game like Monopoly is a roll to move game. You roll some dice and you move forward that many spaces, you follow a bunch of other rules. The most basic games like that, shoots and ladders, um, you know, Candyland, uh, roll and move, move your, your pieces. Generally, they're race type games. You're trying to get to the end first or trying to accumulate the most of a particular resource. Uh, territory control games. Uh, I'm placing pieces down on the board to try to control territory. Um, you know, and there are many different rules, complications there. That's a, a common, common idea. Risk would be an example of that kind of game or diplomacy. Um, games that are worker placement games. Uh, are games where you put out pieces and depending on where you put them, you get resources back. So something like Puerto Rico um, or uh, even something um, like Settlers of Catan uh, is essentially a worker placement game. Those are, are more modern games. Uh, simulation games, uh, minis war games, those go back quite a ways, right? We were we think of you know Napoleon standing around a, a big table with a map and then moving pieces around, uh, you know, practicing war. Uh, and then, of course, people in basements uh, pretending to be Napoleon, uh, having those same kinds of uh, kinds of imagined battles uh, simulated out. Um, two different styles of word games that you will often hear about are Euro games, which tend to be uh, mechanically heavy simulation focused games that are a little bit more abstract. And then Ameritrash games, uh, which are games that tend to be heavily themed focused on heroes and main characters uh, and on more defined goals. Um, so a game like Gloomhaven uh, or Descent, um, any of the Dungeons and Dragons board games are all Ameritrash games. Something like Scythe um, you know, is an abstract strategy game that came out recently, Puerto Rico, Catan, those would be Euro games. Um, modern uh, card games, right? So we, we talk about something like poker, if you go back to the mid 1800s, you get Hoyle writing a book of rules for cards uh, that sort of codified lots of different modern card games. You still have the phrase according to Hoyle, which is to say, you know, by the rules of the game. Um, I don't know if that's as, as common now as it once was, but that was that was a, a way you referred to something being according to the rules. Um, so card games have continued to evolve. We play invent new games all the time that you could play with a uh, traditional 52 card card deck, um, but, uh, you know, or, or new card decks, right? Something like uh, Uno is, you know, a modern game created using cards. Um, plenty of those still come out every year. Collectible card games started around with Magic, uh, Magic the Gathering um, and were games that, uh, have a simulation combat uh, mechanic that have an ever growing pool of cards um, that involve constructing a deck for yourself to use in competition with other players. Those have become quite popular and there's still you know, many different deck building games come out each year. Probably not as popular now as they were in the uh, 1990s and early 2000s, but you still see those uh, pretty commonly. Um, they spawned a, a type of card game, uh, deck building games. Dominion is probably the most uh, well-known of those. Ascension is another one. 
um, in which the that constructing deck part of magic becomes the core mechanic of the game. Everybody has sort of an equally balanced opportunity to construct a deck of cards out of an available pool and building that that deck as an engine of gameplay is the primary style. So for all of these games, uh, I link the resource boardgamegeek.com down below. If you're interested in physical games, uh, if you're interested in picking up a physical game, go there, look at what's interesting and what's popular, read uh, the reviews and discussion of the games before picking them up. Um, if you are obsessed with board games and collect a lot of them, you can record what games you have there, uh, share that list with friends and social network kind of thing. But it's a great place for research into board games. Uh, you can look up games by mechanics, uh, which could be useful in terms of uh, concepts for playtesting. Okay, uh, board game principles. Um, so why would you want to make board games if you really want to make physical games? Well, playtesting, right? So you're, you're wanting to do paper prototypes. Um, and there's no hiding in board games. Uh, the mechanics are exposed. Either the core mechanic of the game is fun, or it's not. There's no, uh, well, the music and the graphics uh, and the story were great. And so I don't mind that the combat was clunky. If the core gameplay loop is not enjoyable, it's very evident uh, in a board game. And so both for playtesting and for honing your craft as a game designer, there's nothing like uh, making board games. Uh, they're easy to do and iterate on individually or in a small team uh, without a lot of technical knowledge. So they're, they're a great tool for learning. Um, and I find a lot of satisfaction in creating and balancing those kinds of games. Um, so basic principles of board games. Uh, one of the most important ones uh, is creating uh, a sense that the game is not uh, fixed and pre-scripted, that you're actually, there's a game to play. And that is often done through introducing randomness into the game. Um, again, roll to move games, how, how far you move forward is a random by a dice roll. Um, you know, in a game of Dungeons and Dragons, you roll to try to hit a monster. Um, uncertainty uh, can be generated by randomness, but isn't necessarily the same thing. For instance, uh, if we're playing rock, paper, scissors, um, then there's no randomness there, right? I made a decision to throw scissors. You made a decision to either throw rock or paper and win or lose. Um, you were uncertain as to what I was going to throw, but there was no randomness involved. So um, that is a distinction and you wanna be careful and understand when you're introducing uncertainty into a game, whether you're doing it through introducing randomness or whether you're doing it uh, through introducing uncertainty based on something else. Um, hidden information is another way you can introduce uncertainty that isn't about randomness. That hidden information could be the cards that are still in my hand in a game of poker or 21, um, or it could be the fog of war in a digital game right? Um, what the other players know. In a game of Battleship, um, I'm uncertain as to where your ships are, but they're not randomly placed. And uh, I'm uncertain because there is hidden information. I can't see what, uh, what ships you've placed on the board where. Um, another principle, um, meaningful choices. So if you play a game of shoots and ladders a few times, you're going to realize that you're not making any decisions. You're just rolling and moving and rolling and moving and rolling and moving. And so is someone else and they either beat you or lose. Um, and uh, that stops being satisfying pretty soon because you aren't making meaningful choices. Um, so what, uh, what could you do to make meaningful choices? You know, different paths, uh, what powers do I use? You know, maybe I, I choose which kind of dice to roll on which turn, and that's going to have effects. Um, you know, roll to move games themselves are, are sort of seen as problematic and not very much fun. Um, so maybe I want to remove randomness from my forward progress entirely so that I choose I can move between one and five spaces forward and I get to make that decision. It's meaningful uh, because each square has a different property to it or something. Um, what happens when you have too many meaningful choices is analysis paralysis, right? And that's the point where it stops being fun to make those decisions. There's just so many of them that you don't understand what you're supposed to do. Um, you know, if I, if I gave you a uh, war game, tabletop war game from the 1980s with, you know, hundreds of different kinds of units and hundreds of tables that govern how all those units perform and said, what's the best move? you could take weeks thinking about it. 
and uh, probably unless you're a certain type of person, that's not going to be a lot of fun for you, especially if you don't know what those rules are and have to keep looking them up and thinking about what you're doing and the game slows to a crawl. Not great. Um, all right. So don't want to have too many choices, but you always want to have a number of meaningful choices at any given point in a game. So someone uh, feels like they have autonomy, that they're in control of what they're doing. Uh, solvability is another problem. Uh, say tic-tac-toe, for instance, almost all of us have solved that game. We understand what the optimal play is at any moment, and there is no, no longer any interest in playing games of tic-tac-toe with people. Uh, if you don't know the solution for tic-tac-toe, look it up. You should probably know that if you're a game designer, um, just as a matter of course. But uh, more complicated games can also be solved, right? Checkers was solved uh, a decade or more ago by computers that can play it perfectly. Uh, chess has been solved by computers recently. Go still hasn't been, but you know it's it's a solvable game. Um, so, is your game something that will become trivial as soon as people have figured out what the optimal choices are, uh, or does it the uncertainty in that game come from another player's behavior, um, making some choices optimal under some circumstances and and not under others? Um, that creating that balance is very important. Um, so. In board games, which tend to be multiplayer, um, as long as one player hasn't, one or both players haven't solved the game, the game can still be enjoyable. Uh, many games, you know, you might only play half a dozen times and that's fine. Um, so you don't necessarily need to make a game that isn't easily solvable as long as your player base won't have solved it and will enjoy the process of, of figuring out that puzzle that you're creating. Common issues in uh, board game design. Uh, things that come up all the time. So player elimination, the circumstance where either uh, a player realizes they're going to lose partway through the game and uh, that isn't very much fun for them, um, or they are eliminated, they're killed or, or you know eliminated from the game early on and have to sit around waiting for everyone else to finish before they can start the game again. So a game of Settlers of Catan where you're far behind an hour into the game, the game's going to be five hours long, and you're just sort of forced to limp along and know you can't win uh, for four hours. Not great. Uh, a game of Mafia or Witch Hunt where you're killed in the first round and have to wait 45 minutes while all of your friends argue about what's going on. Not a lot of fun. Um, so those, that's a problem you need to consider when you're designing those kind of games. Um, there are solutions, uh, but that's for a future class. Uh, skill gaps. Uh, if you have a grandmaster and a child playing chess, neither is going to have a great time because the game relies upon there being equally matched opponents. So uh, if you're um, creating a game of skill, um, how are you going to allow people who are good at the game to be able to enjoy it with people who aren't good? Perhaps there is an element of randomness that allows the person who is not good to have an opportunity to possibly win the game. Uh, quarterbacking. Uh, this is something that often comes up in cooperative games. Uh, Ameritrash board games uh, tend to recently be um, cooperative. Often you and a group of your friends are playing heroes and you're moving along the board, seeking out the great dragon and you're going to kill them. Awesome. Um, except for one player knows the rules of the game and what the optimal plays are and everybody else is still just learning. So that player ends up spending the whole time telling everybody else what they should be doing uh, they might have a great time doing that. Probably everyone else won't. Um, so you want to design games that, uh, that prevent that in one way or another. Um, and again, there are a lot of different strategies for that uh, that are covered in other classes in the program. Uh, but I don't have time to go over all of them in 20 minutes. So feel free to talk to your professors in class if you're curious about any of these things. Uh, put them on the spot and make sure we can all answer these questions. All right, uh, game theory and uh, mechanics. So game theory is not about making board games or games in general, but it comes up a lot and it, uh, it involves physical scenarios at least. So um, the two most common game theory things that you hear about are the prisoner's dilemma. Um, and this is the, the situation where you're thinking of uh, two friends are committing a crime together and they get captured. Uh, and the detective puts them both into separate rooms and, and says to each of them, you know, if you uh, don't say anything, we're going to throw you in prison for a year. But if you uh, rat out your friend, we'll let you go. But your friend's getting five years in jail because, you know, we got your confession. 
Um, and you know, if you rat out your friend, but they also rat you out, you're both staying in prison for three years, which is worse than if you both remain silent. So, you know, if you trust your friend to not, uh, to not rat you out, then, um, then you're both going to only spend one year in prison and that's not so bad, but you're always tempted by the idea like, well, I think I can trust my friend to not tell on me. So I'm going to tell on him and I'm going to get out for free. Um, and uh, the game theory is not that setup. It's the mathematical solution to what the optimal behavior is in that circumstance to maximize your rewards versus the, the costs that are put up. Um, that's relatively simple, uh, relatively, uh, in terms of the basic prisoner's dilemma. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a optimal behavior for it. Um, however, it gets more complicated if you say, well, what happens if you repeat this over and over again? Um, you know, and, and I know what your behavior was last time. Um, then it becomes much more complicated. You get that diagram down on the bottom where what the, uh, what the optimal behavior is depends on a lot of different circumstances. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's the prisoner's dilemma. Tragedy of the commons is another one you hear about a lot, which is the idea that uh, a town has a resource, a, you know, a field in the center of town. And uh, if you are hanging out living in town and you uh, feed your goat uh, by taking them to the town common, then your goat can eat. And you don't have to walk them all the way out to the fields outside of town. So win. Um, but there are a bunch of people in town, and if everybody brings in their goat to uh, to eat at the town common. The common gets completely obliterated. Nothing grows there anymore, and now nobody can use that resource. So limited resource that can be depleted by everybody abusing that. Uh, what's the optimal behavior to manage that uh, that situation? Um, so. Why are we talking about these if they aren't games? Well, these kind of uh, game theory core mechanics are often uh, very difficult to solve, uh, at least on the fly, and especially if you add complications, right? If you're playing a uh, tactical uh, strategy game and the prisoner's dilemma is a mechanic that you can use to ally or attack your enemies, but whether or not uh, what that reward and cost is varies depending on the state of the board, then it becomes very difficult for any normal human to actually know what the optimal play is. Uh, and so that becomes a, a good hinge for your, your um, social or strategic gameplay to uh, revolve around. Um, so any game that you incorporate one of these into is meaty, but you should be careful because often they are really hard challenges, really difficult choices to make philosophically or, or just in terms of uh, winning or losing. And that isn't always fun for players. So finding a way to incorporate game theory concepts into your games um, in ways that is still fun and doesn't become uh, a, a chore for your players uh, can be difficult, uh, but rewarding. Uh, okay, so moving on, uh, role-playing games. So we've talked a little bit about uh, you know, uh, development of games, a little bit about board games and historical and modern. Role-playing games happen pretty recently um, or are ancient. Um, historically, you could look at something like playing house as being a role-playing game. Uh, you know, uh, the, the no longer socially acceptable cowboys and Indians that children in America played for, for generations. Um, you know, these, these uh, fantasy games that children play uh, are role-playing. Um, more recently, in the 1970s, Dungeons and Dragons was created by Gary Gygax and uh, others. And uh, they were people who played these uh, simulation war games, but wanted something that was more focused on an individual heroes and their actions. They came up with this uh, set of rules for Dungeons and Dragons and advanced Dungeons and Dragons and the many iterations they're on, uh, we're on fifth edition now, uh, and it's still probably the most popular tabletop role-playing game in the world. Um, always, or almost always a fantasy setting using that, uh, that basic rule set. In the uh, 1990s, uh, a company called White Wolf started making tabletop role-playing games with a different system, focused more on narrative and storytelling. In fact, it was called the Storyteller System uh, in the World of Darkness. And it was vampires and werewolves and 
mages and wraiths and changelings and and so on um all urban urban horror urban fantasy um more focused on role playing and then uh since that time since the beginning of role playing games but increasingly there have been uh lots and lots of indie role playing games the rise of the internet and the ease of distribution uh has definitely fueled that uh revolution the systems like fate uh that are great at simulating a uh say a noir setting where your hero is uh takes a lot of damage and loses a lot in the beginning but builds up uh, a fate resource and then can really win big at the end uh it's great for telling detective stories there's a, a game called apocalypse world whose system has been uh, adopted as powered by the apocalypse and is used in uh role playing games for all different kinds of settings uh um anything you can imagine there's a power by powered by the apocalypse version that is uh are based around that setting there are more modern games uh that are intensely focused on a particular experience for the user such as the game dread that is uh about uh teen slasher horror kind of games where uh all the players are being pursued by pursued by some terrible monster and uh they get picked off one by one and you know maybe they succeed in the end or maybe they they all die uh the main mechanic of that game instead of rolling dice um is uh drawing uh blocks from a jenga tower and when the jenga tower falls one of the players dies um and so it creates the the kind of tension and dread uh that that genre is known for uh or the tragic horror game 10 candles where every time a player fails a roll one candle is put out and when the 10th candle is put out everyone dies every game ends with all the players dying um and in fact they are the last living humans so that is a, a rather rather intense dark game uh but with a very specific mechanic focused on creating that experience and there's literally thousands of of additional games um storytelling games role playing games are fascinating um and a whole a whole different genre of gameplay uh the techniques in them are very useful for simulating in paper prototypes uh the kind of social interactions you might want to have in a role playing game or a narrative game um practicing that kind of uh interactive dynamic storytelling uh is a great way to build your chops as a narrative designer all right field games so this is where we talk about modern uh field games uh football rugby baseball basketball hockey curling right like all of these games that we play as sports are uh you know codified um relatively modern field games um there are lots of informal field games as well um tag and hide and go seek being you know two great examples uh played by children everywhere um they have rules they're clearly games and they're just played uh you know on a field in in the open um modern uh field games that have been created uh, recently things like paintball or laser tag capture the flag right all of those kind of things are modern field games you could probably argue that uh, obstacle course racing would be a modern field game um you can have digitally enhanced uh field games such as Johann Sebastian Joust uh which is played with PlayStation Move controllers where if you move them too much they turn red you're trying to be the last person holding a controller uh you can have up to 16 controllers networked um and uh the sensitivity of the controller varies depending on the speed of the music and it's all played to uh yeah Johann uh, Sebastian Bach uh music so tremendously fun game uh digitally enhanced physical game other games that have uh physical um uh components uh VR and AR games such as Beat Saber uh you know the game is your controls directly map to the actions of the character even though they're taking place in VR so that might be considered a field game i could have arguments about that something like zombie run where it's a fitness game but there is a you know digital reward component uh quest and so on that you're doing uh to create a narrative around the physical behavior and something like you know any of the uh geolocated games pokemon go uh the new witcher game uh those kind of things are are also uh could be considered modern field field games so there's tons of design rules around all our design theory around all of those different things um none of them are living just within the screen of your computer so you need to think about them as also being uh within the scope of game design and live action role playing games um so 
those those geeks sitting around in a basement uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons weren't content to stay there. Uh, they thought what would be really cool is if we all got foam swords and went out and played this out, uh, you know, on the front lawn and uh, at the local 4-H camp or uh, Boy Scout camp. And uh, these kind of games involved or evolved to something called buffer LARPing, buffers being the foam weapons. Uh, those kind of games are sometimes run as a one-off, you know, for a few hours of, of playing out a scenario or long ongoing campaigns that have literally been going on at this point for generations. There are second and third generation people playing in some of these games that have been played every few months for years and years, um, you know, and uh, often involve two, three, 400 people. Um, there are theater LARPs, which are more story focused games. Uh, again, those are often played at conventions and festivals uh, where the game might last an hour to four hours, one evening. Um, and also sometimes are played in campaigns where you have games that are, you know, every or every fourth weekend uh, and take place over years. The uh, White Wolf Game Company uh, sponsors a bunch of uh, theater LARPs that are played regularly in different cities around the world that are all connected and have an overarching plot line that has been going on for more than a decade, more than two decades at this point, uh, called One World by Night, where you can play a vampire and you know when you go on vacation out to Los Angeles, you can play in a game out there as the same character and spread your reputation. Uh, you know, living out a whole a whole second life as that character. Those games do not use physical combat; they use a rock paper scissors system to create uncertainty when you're uh, in randomization. Um, not random, but you know, uncertainty and in interactions with others. Um, and then lastly, uh, modern LARPs uh, that are more abstract. Uh, are often called Nordic LARPs. Um, Nordic countries are, are where they originated from, although they're now written and played all around the world. Um, some of those games are very similar to theater style LARPs, although they tend to be a bit more abstract. Um, one in particular I'll mention is called White Death, in which the gameplay space is defined by a spotlight in a dark room. Uh, everyone playing the game is just wearing black clothing, but pretending to be a survivor in a snowstorm, uh, very evocative music plays in the background while uh, you interact with the people around you. Your interactions are governed by two rules that you randomly draw. Uh, one is a physical rule, which might be something like one of your hands always has to be touching the ground. Then another one is a social rule, which might be like you're better than all of the people who are taller than you. You get those two things combined and you, you're interacting with everyone as if you were superior to them while being crawling around on the ground. Um, that sounds very abstract, but I can say that having played that game, it is the best designed and most powerful game that I've ever played full stop. Um, so you can learn a lot from about creating a particular experience from looking at Nordic LARPs. Um, Celia Pierce has a lot of experience in LARP design. Uh, I believe Brandon Schilling does as well. And uh, I've certainly written and run a bunch of those over the course of my career as well. So. There tends to be a stigma against role-playing to a degree. Um, it's more socially acceptable now with people like Ben Diesel coming out as gamers, uh, as tabletop role players, um, but it still has some stigma and uh, live action role-playing even more so. But um, look beyond that, you're a game designer and there's a lot to learn, a uh, lot to learn there. Okay, so um, to bring this to a close, um, I want to talk a little bit about the second video this week, which is going to be on game design patterns. Um, I ended up becoming involved in game design patterns, which are my primary area of research uh, at a board game convention, board game making convention called Metatopia, where people bring their games in development and test them. Uh, there was a speaker there who was talking about their uh, LARP patterns project. And uh, they had identified a bunch of different patterns in the way people behave in live action role playing games. Um, for instance, if you want to create a social game, they say you should organize your physical space to have uh, groups of chairs or tables that seat three to five people. Because if fewer than three people are interacting together, they're not going to be political. And if more than five people are interacting together, their conversations don't to ge generate political intrigue either. So by physically designing the space in that way, you facilitate a particular kind of experience. Uh, they had uh, generated a number of patterns around that idea and were interested in creating more. Um, I had heard about game design pattern or design patterns before 
through computer science. Um, and I knew that a gentleman named Christopher Alexander had originated the idea in the 1970s. I went off and read his work, studied the other um, applications of his work in game design, decided that there was a lot there, but more work to be done, and ended up writing the book Pattern Language for Game Design. Um, and the second video for this week is a more in-depth discussion of, of that whole process. So thank you for joining me this week. Uh, I will see you again around week 10 uh, for the next video that I will be, uh, that I will be narrating. So enjoy class and thank you for listening.